So these are just gonna kind of keep going. They're gonna be the same. I don't even know how many there are, 12 or whatever. So <laughs> you have to, it's me. So I think almost all the person, everyone in the picture is gonna be me. There might be one or two other people. Um, so these are all, these are all uh, from the zoo. So if you have any particular questions about anything, um, we can talk about them at some point too. <laughs> So I'll just start by kind of introducing myself. My name is Audra Byram. I live here in Berwick. I have lived here for about 13 years. Um, and so for 17 years, I worked at York's Wild Kingdom. Uh, so I started when I was still in college. I do have a degree in zoology. Um, so that was kind of a good way to get started. But the nice thing about this zoo, about York's Wild Kingdom, is they don't actually require a degree. Um, so I was working towards mine, which was a good first step. Um, but they don't necessarily require that you have that. So. If it's something you think you want to get into, I definitely suggest trying it out first because zookeeping is really hard. It is a lot of hard work. Like, do you remember this last week where it was like 95 degrees and super, super humid? Those zookeepers are out there taking care of the animals every single day. The animals have to eat. They have to get cleaned up after. So if you don't really like being outside when it's raining or it's hot and you just can't get over it, you might want to pick a different career. <laughs> um, so yeah, so this was a really, really interesting job. Um, I learned so much being there about animals, but also about myself and about my coworkers and about work. Um, so this was a really great experience for me. <laughs> um, so I brought some things. Uh, does anyone have any questions like before I, I kind of go into it? Please go ahead. The last time I saw you was, was in 16 year, years. You saw me 16 years ago? <gasps> wow, you look very good for your age. <laughs> Where did you see me? Did you see me at the zoo? You did? I believe you. Yeah, I used to give the animal presentations at the zoo too. So we would have um, porcupines and monkeys and quadamundis. Yeah, so we worked with all different kinds of animals. Um, they have, if anyone hasn't been to the zoo before, they have all kinds of different animals. They have zebras, they have kangaroos, they have lions, they have prairie dogs, they have, that's a kookaburra, they have goats. Everyone loves to feed the goats. They get a little pushy sometimes though, so you gotta be careful. Um, the deer, they have all different kinds of birds, primates, monkeys, uh, apes, so all kinds of different things. You kind of have to learn how to take care of otters. <laughs> um, so yeah, any other questions? Yeah. My favorite animal, so oh, I get this question a lot. Um, I really like taking care of a lot of the primates because to me, especially when they were in social groups, it was almost like a glimpse into the past. You know, they are similar in ways to human societies and how they kind of take care of each other and watch out for each other. And so that was always really interesting to me. They were really intelligent um, and it was a little more complicated to take care of because they have a lot of, needs um, so that includes like mental stimulation so I know one of these pictures is a black and white ruffed lemur um, kind of sitting on top of a green thing um, so what we did there uh, those were called foraging units so instead of just feeding them out of a dish which you know if anyone has a dog Cats sometimes take a little longer, but usually dogs at home, they just kind of snarf up all their food and that's it. And they go, you know, you play with them or do whatever else. But for these animals, we're really hands off. So we don't handle them. We don't play with them. Um, we really treat them like wild animals, which is what they are. Even if they were born in captivity, they're still wild animals. They still have a lot of those same instincts, almost all those same instincts. So um, we don't take them for a walk like you would for your dog. We don't play ball with them, but we have to figure out other ways to kind of keep them mentally and physically active. So these foraging units, um, it's kind of, uh, I don't know, I should have brought one. I, I have one at home. Um, so it's a plastic thing and it has um, kind of grooves cut out in it. And then there's a top that we put on top of it that just has a couple holes drilled into it. And then we kind of screw it all in. Yep, right there. Screw it all together. 
And so they have to turn that top disc to get to all the food inside there. So it takes them much longer to eat their food throughout the day instead of just um, you know, out of a bucket and kind of eating everything all at once and then being all done. Because out in the wild, um, they would be spending up to 70% of their day looking for food, especially primates. So we want to kind of give them that natural activity that they would be doing in the wild through looking for food, eating food. Some of them, um, like I think there's a picture of fennec fox in there also that has um, a foraging unit as well. Some of them will take the food out and put it in their cheeks and then they'll kind of run away, dig a little hole and then bury it for later. And they'll empty out all the food and hide it all throughout. <laughs> so it will be empty very fast, but they'll still have to go around and look for all their food wherever they hid it. <laughs> Does anyone have any other questions? Yeah. I've been, I've been here one time. I've been here two times. You have at the library or at the zoo? I've been, I've been here two, at the two times. One too. Yeah? I love the library. It's fantastic, isn't it? Did you have fun at the zoo? Yeah? What was your favorite thing to see? Um, a red bird. A red bird, yeah. A red bird. Yeah, like the parrots? No, a leopard. Oh, a leopard. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm, mine's eight now, so I'm out of the kids. Yeah? And it, and it, and the wagon on the other part and up in blue. Whoa, very cool. Any other questions? Anybody? Yeah. Why do some animals uh, just live in different areas? Like, um, so why did some animals live in different areas and now they're in zoos or now they've kind of moved like maybe we didn't used to have bobcats up here a lot of years ago or we did have wolves and now we don't. So you mean like out in the wild? Yeah. Well, that's a good question. So a lot of that has to do um, with the different temperatures there are now. So. Um, it used to be colder in New England <laughs> decades and decades and centuries and centuries ago. So bobcats couldn't survive up here because their fur is too thin. But there's something, the lynx, more of them used to live down here and they're moving up north. So the bobcats are kind of moving up north because it's getting warmer. And the lynx are moving farther up north because it's getting too warm for them down here and they need to stay where it's cold. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah? Okay, good. Yeah? Are the animals happy at the zoo? That's a great question. So everyone wants to make sure that animals are content and well taken care of, right? So we don't usually use words like happy for animals just because there's no real way of knowing what happy means. So we want to make sure that all of their needs are met and they seem content is what we usually say. So there's lots of ways that you can tell if, um, you know, something, even if your dog or your cat, you know, there's something wrong. Maybe they're pawing a lot at the door. Or they're licking themselves a lot. So I think we do a really good job of trying to make sure that the animals have all of their needs met and they're really content. So we make sure that they have proper nutrition every day, they have veterinary care, um, they have this mental stimulation that I told you about. It's not just the foraging units, a lot of that is for the primates, but also we'll do things like, um, for the big cats, we'll freeze uh, pieces of meat in like a little bucket, and then on really hot days especially, we will pop that out so you have like a meatsicle, meat popsicle, <laughs> and then we throw it into the pen so they have that nice cold something, but also it's kind of like they can't get to it right away. They have to work on it. They can't get to that meat right away. Um, so we try and do a lot of things. We'll also sometimes give them um, different smells, so animals that are really into smell, once again, like the big cats, you know, maybe a little bit of mint extract or something like that, something natural. Um, but that they wouldn't come across every single day. So it is, that is one of the things that makes zookeeping a really difficult job is you have to kind of be very observant as to what the animal's behavior is telling you about what's going on maybe inside its head or inside its world and try and make sure that you give it the best life that you really can. Any other questions? Okay, go ahead. Why is that? 
that's you know that's a good question i don't I, <laughs> I am not familiar with this piece of equipment alana was working it for me was there another picture you wanted to see or you just wanted to keep seeing the pictures so we could talk about them the yeah the pictures are fun aren't they yeah go ahead why do some animals like that uh why do some animals in the have the their habitat where they have it and Oh, so like they can live in kind of different areas. Yeah, there are some. So we think about things like raccoons. They can live out in the woods, right, and be totally fine. But also lots of times we'll find raccoons in our cities. So that's those kind of animals are really good at taking advantage of whatever resources are around. So resources are things like food and shelter. Um, so some animals are really good at that and you can find them in a wide area of places. And some animals really have very specific needs and they need to be just in a desert or just in a rainforest. Any other questions? Yeah. I don't believe there are any frogs there. At a time, we had some tree frogs, but I don't think they're there anymore. Do you like frogs? Yeah, me too. They're really cool. Do you like to listen to them at night? Do you hear them? You don't know? Don't notice? <laughs> I love the sound of the frogs at night. I wanted to show you guys, too. I'll tell you about some of the stuff I have um, here just for the moment. So these are fallow deer antlers. So these are the kind of deer that they have at the zoo that you can go in and feed. And if they come out or you know want to, um, you can pet them as well. Uh, we don't have the males. So only the boys, the males, have antlers. Um, so we don't have them usually out with people when they have big antlers like this. You might imagine why. This is pretty, pretty dangerous. So what do you guys think they use their antlers for? Raise your hand. Tell me. Protection, yeah, kind of. So, yeah, they use them kind of to figure out who's boss. So there has to be kind of one boss deer. This is true in a lot of animals that live in groups. Lots of times you have to have one boss. In some kind of animals, um, it's a female. In some kind of animals, it's a male. So in these guys, the boys or the males, figure out who's in charge. And they do that by smacking their antlers together. So they kind of, you know, like that and it's really loud. Um, so they smack them together and they really try, they actually don't want to hurt each other. They just want to just enough so that they know who's boss. So maybe some of you have siblings and maybe you know this idea, like maybe you just want to pinch them just hard enough that he knows you're in charge. <laughs> so they actually don't want to hurt each other because that would be bad to have an injured animal in the group. It could draw predators. It would be harder for them to help find resources. So they don't really want to injure each other. They just kind of do it just gently to figure out who's in charge for the most part. And then as a contrast, we actually don't have these at the zoo anymore, um, but they were great. These are antlers from a muntjac deer, full grown, Muntjac deer, they are about, I think they're about 20 pounds or so. Um, only the males have antlers, but they also have very sharp canine teeth as well. So they have these tiny little antlers that you can imagine are not quite as good for defense <laughs> as these big antlers are, um, but they also have sharp canine teeth that they can use in figuring out who's boss. Um, any other questions or any questions about deer? Yeah, go ahead. Do what again? Put the teeth out. These ones? These are antlers, but they also have like teeth. <laughs> yeah? Um, what, um, what is that standing Oh, yeah. Okay. We can talk about that for sure. Any guesses? Who wants yeah. to guess? Tell me. Um, it's a fox. Nope. Any other guesses? A dinosaur egg? I wish. I think I would be rich if I had a dinosaur egg. <laughs> yeah? Snake! Snake. You think it's a snake egg? Let me tell you about a snake egg. So, snake eggs are kind of soft and leathery. Reptiles that lay eggs, their eggs are really soft and leathery. Any other guesses? Who's got one? Tell chicken me. Egg. A chicken egg. Chicken egg. Mmm. 
This is, this is almost, almost as big as the body of one of my chickens, I think. So think about the biggest bird you can think of. I'll tell you that. It's a bird egg. Go ahead. It is an ostrich egg. So this is an ostrich egg. Um, we emptied it out, so drilled a little hole in there and emptied it all out because, you know, it would actually explode, like, if you <laughs> left all the stuff in there. Um, so it's, it's fairly fragile, um, but I'll let you guys come up and take a look at some point when we're kind of all done here. So yeah, that's an ostrich egg. Um, there's all these, all these facts about how many, how many eggs it's equal to. I think it's a, equal to like 30 chicken eggs or something approximate to that. We actually have, um, you can eat them. They're totally edible, just like really any other egg. Um, we have done that. We have scrambled ostrich eggs. Um, they are fine. They taste just like regular eggs. Um, so yeah, that was an interesting experience that you don't get everywhere. Um, which? This? Okay, so this, I'm gonna be really careful with this one. This one I would ask everyone to not touch just because it is kind of fragile and it's really special to my husband. It is a Dama gazelle skull. So special kind of gazelle. You guys know gazelle, kind of kind of deer-like. They live usually out in the plains or um, grasslands. So you can see the teeth here. This is just the top part. It doesn't have the bottom jaw. You can see the teeth here. This is where the eyes were. This is its nose, and it still has its horns attached. Ooh, here's a great one. Does anybody know the difference between antlers and horns? So these are horns, and these are antlers. Does anybody know what makes them different? What do you think? Yeah? <laughs> so antlers, I bet you guys know about deer, like the deer that live around here, right? You saw one in your neighbor's backyard. So right now, the boy and the deer, yeah? It's really cool to see them because we don't always see them even though we know there's so many. That is so special, isn't it? I love seeing them together. Um, you saw some fawns? Did they have, did they have spots? Yeah, they, I bet they had spots, right? Does anyone know how come the fawns, the baby deer have spots and the grown-up deer don't have spots? Because they're, because they're, they have babies. Yeah, they're, they have spots when they're babies only. That's right. Do we know? Does anyone know why? Yeah. Well, because, uh, the, because they both have uh, something else different. Something different between the grown-ups and the babies? Yeah, that's true too. The big reason why the grown-up ones don't have any spots but the little ones do is because the little ones are kind of too young to run around as fast as the big ones, right? So during the day, the moms kind of leave the little ones tucked in the grass all day. So those little spots help them be camouflaged. It helps them to blend in with the grasses so that they're not as noticeable to predators. And then when the mom's all done eating and getting food, she comes back and she either kind of nudges the little one up or she makes a little call for it. And then they get up and go away. All right, I was talking, oh, horns and antlers, that's right. <laughs> okay, so we've seen deer around here, right? So this time of year, the boys and the girl deer, they don't really look too different. Does anyone know about like in the fall what happens? Anyone ever seen? Maybe not quite this big. <laughs> what did you, I heard it. What did you say? Their antlers fall off. That's right. So this gazelle, do we think his horns ever fell off? No. No, that's right. So antlers grow new every single year. So if you think about, and they only grow in just a couple months, right? Like the deer around here, they have antlers a little bit. They're hard to see right now, but by fall, they'll be really big, hopefully, right? <laughs> really big antlers. So this is actually one of the fastest growing tissue outside of cancerous tissue for all the adults. Is, um, so this is one of the fastest growing tissue because it is very hard right now, but it gets covered with a soft, 
um, velvety substance while it's still growing. It is living tissue while it's growing, but then all of that dries up and flakes off and becomes really hard. Um, so it's a really interesting, uh, from a scientific and research point of view, um, to know that that is a really fast growing tissue. So yeah, horns stay on for the whole life. They usually continuously grow kind of up to a certain point. Um, and then antlers fall off every year and grow back, other than pronghorn, but that's a little different. Go ahead. Why do they lose their antlers every year? That's a good question. So why would they lose their antlers every year? Um, so if we think about animals living out in the woods, in the wild, in the middle of winter, what do you think it's like out there? Do you think it's like really relaxing and it's pretty easy to find food or is it kind of tough out there in the winter? Yeah, cold. it's a little tough and it's cold. That's true. It's cold. And all the grass is buried All the grass is buried. It's hard to find food. Absolutely. So if this deer had all of this extra weight that he had to be carrying around all the time, it would be a lot harder for him to get through the trees, to put his head down, to find the grasses that are buried. Um, it would just take more energy. So the more weight, the more unnecessary things you have, the more energy you have to expend, which is probably the reason why we don't really see a lot of animals with horns around here. You see a lot more animals with antlers and animals with horns tend to be in places where it's a little bit warmer other than like you've got the sheep, like doll sheep and things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does it get cold? Does it get cold? Um, well, that's a good question. It might, uh, but they do only kind of grow them in the summer and then the velvet comes off in the fall and then it's just this kind of bony substance. Um, so they might get cold just like, you know, the tip of our nose or the, um, our ears get cold. That's a good question. I've never thought about that. I know they are sensitive and they will, ble like if they're in velvet and it gets scratched, it will bleed a little bit. So there is blood supply there because it is, you know, it's growing. So it has to have a blood supply for it to grow. Yeah. How come fawns don't go in the winter? How, how come they're not born in the winter? Or how come they get bigger? The, they don't go to the winter of the fawns. Well, they grow up, right? They grow up and get bigger, so they lose their spots and they get more like the grown-up deer. That's why lots of things around here, especially where it gets cold in the winter and it's really difficult life, most things you'll notice are born early in the spring as soon as the grasses start to come up and the berries start to come out so that there's food and they have time to grow when it's warm and get big enough to be able to stay warm throughout the winter. Yeah. Yeah. Does antlers get hot? Do antlers get hot? Maybe they get hot when they're like, just like they might get cold. Maybe they get hot while they're still growing. Yeah, they might get warm. <laughs> All warm. <laughs> yeah. You saw what? Oh yeah, you did. Oh well, what happened after that? Oh yeah, sometimes that happens. Just like you know, sometimes even people get an injury, and you know, maybe it never really gets all the way better. So <laughs> that is that's hard, but that is also kind of part of life. Does anyone have any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> Where do they live? How long did deer live? 
Um, they don't actually, most things out in the wild don't live a very long time because once again, it's hard to find food. There's no veterinarians to take care of them. There's predators out there. Um, so usually deer in the wild will live mm, maybe about six or so years as an average, maybe a little longer, kind of depends. Um, oh, let me tell you about porcupines too. So these quills that I have, are from African crested porcupines, which are um, what they have at the zoo. But those are a little bit different than the ones that we have around here, but they do definitely have quills in common. These are clearly much bigger than our porcupines that live around here. But I wanna ask you guys, now by a show of hands, who thinks that porcupines can shoot their quills? Okay, and then who thinks that porcupines cannot shoot their quills? All right, so we're a little split. So let me tell you, it's a very common myth. Porcupines cannot shoot out their quills. So you can get pretty close to one. I don't recommend it, <laughs> but it's not gonna shoot its quills at you. So what they do when they're feeling nervous, have you ever been really scared and you can feel the hair on your arms stand up in the back of your neck? It's kind of the same idea. When they get scared and nervous, all these quills on their backs stand up. So it makes them look much bigger, makes them look like something that maybe you wouldn't want to mess with. And they'll give some warning signs. They'll kind of stamp their feet. They actually have these special quills. The African crested porcupines have special quills on their tails that are hollow. And when they shake their tail really fast, it makes a sound like another really dangerous animal that shakes its tail when it's scared. A rattlesnake, that's right, very good. Yeah, absolutely, so it makes that kind of warning noise. Um, so if whatever's bothering it doesn't back off after all of those warning signs. I have a stuffed rattlesnake. You do? <laughs> Does it rattle? Yeah. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool, that's a cool stuffed animal. So they'll have all these quills all stood up and what they'll do is they'll turn around and face their hind end towards whatever is bothering them and they'll run straight backwards towards it. So with these quills for the African crested porcupine, I mean, they're just very tough. I could probably break it, but I, I mean, I obviously don't really want to, but they're really tough. They're sharp. Um, it's, you know, it's sharp like a pencil. It's not sharp like a needle. Um, but if it's going at you at 20 miles an hour, it's really gonna do some damage. So um, you may have heard that the quills of porcupines that we have around here are what's called barbed. That is true. Uh, the difference between that is that, so if this goes into something, I could just put it into my shirt, I guess. Um, it just comes right back out. If I had a North American porcupine quill and I poked it into that shirt and then I tried to pull it out, it's like a fish hook. So it has kind of backwards facing little hooks on it. So if it goes into something, kind of stays sticking in there. If anyone's ever had a dog that's got porcupine quills, you have to go and have a vet take them out probably, unless you can do it yourself, which means you have a pretty good dog. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that is kind of how they're different, but they do the same thing. They can't shoot their quills. They just kind of run backwards into whatever's bothering them. Our Porcupines around here have kind of a long tail and they can kind of swap with that tail too. Yeah. Can we do the feathers? Do them? What do you want? You want me to talk about them? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I can. I bet everyone can tell me what this is. Let me hear it. A peacock feather. Yeah, you're right. It's a peacock feather. Yeah, they are so I know there's a picture in there of what of the peacock. Um there it is. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that is, yeah. So the cool thing about them and actually all birds is they have lots of different kinds of feathers on different parts of their bodies for different purposes. So this one looks a little bit different than this one. These ones are all from the tail. So you can see it has them all, only the males have the tails like that. So only the boys, that's for impressing the girls, trying to get them interested. So I thought I had a couple more. I guess I have a couple like this. So the cool thing is that most birds have different kinds of feathers for different purposes. They have feathers for display. They have feathers for flying. So the feathers on their wings look different from the feathers on the rest of their bodies. You guys probably know about turkeys that we have that live around here. Kind of similar. We can call them like, you know, those are North American peacocks, right? They spread their tails all out to try and impress the females. Um, all right, what else do I have for feathers? 
Uh, I meant to send pictures of everything I have. Oh, so there's another picture of <laughs> me holding a pheasant. Um, so this, I think, comes from that um, bird. So this is, a, uh, this is a pheasant tail feather as well. So it's long. That's a crane. I think I have, I thought I had a crane. I think this one is, no, where'd they go? <laughs> so that one comes from the crane. Um, there it is. So he doesn't have much of a tail in that picture. Probably he had been molting at that point. But um, so this is a tail feather from a red gold pheasant, which is what is in that picture right there. Um, this is a kookaburra feather. So the one that had the snake in its mouth. There's a picture. So that comes from a kookaburra. There's a couple other. Yeah, that's the one. Um, this one comes from the, I think it was, this is probably from the cassowaries or the emus. Cool thing about this is there's one point where it grows out of and then two feathers come out of it. So it actually gives them kind of a hair-like covering. It's a little bit warmer and those are for a lot of the birds that don't fly. So cassowaries and emus, they run really fast but they can't fly so they don't need flight feathers. Yeah. What snakes eat birds? Probably anyone that can, just about. <laughs> Lots of snakes will eat almost anything they come across as long as they can catch it. So, you know, uh, let's see, what do we, gar garter snakes are probably a little small, the ones that we have around here, but certainly. You do. Whoa. Yeah, so it was good to put it back in the wild. Good idea. Um, so a couple of the other things that I have, this is a piece of a claw that came from the sloth that there's a picture of. Sloths have really long claws because they hang upside down all day and they need that to kind of um, hold their weight. <laughs> What's that? To climb, that's right, yeah, to climb too. And did you know, okay, ready? Sloths only poop once a week. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? So you know they're really slow, but that means their digestion moves really slow too. So once a week they climb down their tree, they do their business, and then they climb back up. That's it. So that's an interesting fact. That's right. Then they just wait. Oh, good for another week. <laughs> um, I also have some alligator teeth up here. Some of these things, I don't know what timings like, Shiloh, if you... Um, Okay, yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly, I, I see what's happening. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I feel the room. Um, so there's a couple of things if people want to come up and take a look or if anyone has any other questions, um, you can feel free to come up. But if there's anything else, thank you guys so much for coming. I really appreciate you coming out to hear me talk. Okay, you want to pick up and feel how heavy that one is? Is that so heavy? It's not heavy, not to you. That's a cool one, isn't it? That one's from the pheasant. Yeah, these are from Paris.